you want to attract A players today, you need to demonstrate how you can heal their career wounds. And most mm -hmm. people have them. You know, there's a lot of people that are in jobs right now that are working, they're okay, they're doing well in their jobs, but they're not really in a place where like they're really thriving. And so if you're able to kind of tap them on the shoulder, have a conversation with them, learn what these career wounds are, and then be able to demonstrate or connect the dots for them that your opportunity actually helps them heal those career wounds. That person's getting to a place where in which they're they're going to be able to grow their career and you're getting a, a player that's going to just crush it in your company. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by the wonderful Rick Gerard, who is a startup um, founder of an IT business. He's a long time um, per per person who's passionate about recruiting the right people in your business. He's an author of a fabulous book and many, many more things. We're going to find out a lot about Rick over the next sort of half an hour or so. So welcome to the show, Rick. Hey, thank you for having me, Deborah. Oh, absolute pleasure. Hey, look, we've just been having a bit of a chat before we came onto the podcast. You've got quite an interesting background. So you've always been really passionate about people and getting people in the right space. Tell us a little bit about your history and how you came to be where you are today. Yeah, most definitely. So, you know, I had inspired to be a professional photographer oh. and kind of went that realm in school and then actually quickly uh, discovered that, you know, the poor starving artist lifestyle just wasn't for me. <laughs> so um, I, uh, I was fortunate enough to kind of uh, get recruited to get into a job that I knew really nothing about, but I knew that my boss did really well financially. And, um, and the opportunity also arose that I could actually move up to the mountains and be able to snowboard, which was something I was passionate about at the time. So I really moved up to snowboard and I ended up uh, falling into a career. That's kind of the way I categorize wow. it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that career was recruitment. And tell us a little bit about yes. that journey. Yeah, I was headhunting for uh, Silicon Valley startups, which, you know, at the time, and we're going back, you know, quite a few years. I mean, I had hair and everything back then. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, in the time, uh, it was kind of during the whole dot com bubble when I started, which was, um, you know, it, it was kind of one of those things where you really didn't have to be good at what you did. You just had to be able to like get people interested in companies and, and cause it was just like this crazy feeding frenzy. Yep. Um, so I did quite well. Um, I, you know, in, it was kind of a, a transactional journey. I did really well from a financial perspective. Um, I was able to help build a, a really strong business and, um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, around kind of that 9-11 time frame, when that happened, um, I, I decided to kind of pack up and sell all my stuff and move to Hawaii. Oh. But I still so then I, I was like the guy doing recruiting in the Silicon Valley from Hawaii. So I just kind of what was nice is that it gave me the opportunity to be able to to really do what I, what I love to do, like from anywhere. So we switched then, from snowboarding to surfing, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I grew up surfing and then got into snowboarding and then, you know, decided to go back to surfing because I, I was living in the mountains for a while and yep. um, I, I was missing the ocean. And then, uh, yeah, then I don't know why, I just keep flip-flopping. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. So, so we're in Hawaii, we're still recruiting for Silicon Valley. Um, yep. Obviously, the bubble has burst a wee bit now. So what happens next? <laughs> Yeah, so the bubble burst. Um, I actually did some recruiting over in Japan, which was super fun. Uh, that was really an interesting experience. And then when the market picked up again, I got back into the Silicon Valley and helped uh, build a whole bunch of startups. Um, I had a small staff of people, and and we um, we for quite a few years we were like just crushing it. We were having a lot of fun. Um, it was kind of a lifestyle company for me because I was doing a lot more surfing than I was working. <laughs> um, but then I, I kind of came to a point where um, I had the realization that I, I kind of got to get back to, uh, you know, fulfilling my purpose and, and that being helping, really, really helping executives and entrepreneurs and startup founders do a much better job of hiring so that their chances of success uh, are, are, you know, are great. Are greater than what they are because right now you have you know such a minuscule chance of succeeding mm, as sure. a company. Yeah. And I know I know that you're a bit of an EOS fanboy, and obviously Gina Wickman has written the foreword for your new book, which is great. Yep. So we we always talk about the right people in the right seats, and yep. we know how important people can make or break a company, really, can't they? Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. And well, well, you know, like years ago, somebody said to me, well, okay, well, how do I know if I'm getting the right person in the right seat? Mm -hmm. And that was the challenge that I kind of took on is that, you know, there, there is, you know, like EOS, there's a, there's a methodology that you plug into that essentially helps you operate your business very like in a, in a, in a fashion that, that sets you up for success, right? Yeah. Yeah. It enables you to get what you want out of your business. Um, but there wasn't ever anything like that when it came to hiring. And especially, you know, what I, what I discovered was the biggest problem in hiring is not getting people in the funnel because there's a million tools out there to do that. The biggest problem mm -hmm. in hiring is once you get somebody in the funnel and you take them through the interview process, that's where the wheels come off the bus. Mm. Because guess what? We don't know how to interview. No. It, it, we have conversations with people most of the time that have nothing to do with uh, they, they might have a little bit to do with the work and, and some of the other things, but um, we're not gathering enough evidence to support whether or not somebody should be hired. It, it's usually like, hey, do I like this person? Do I feel like this person uh, is somebody that I can spend, you know, eight hours a day with? Yep. And that's the criteria by which people are evaluated. Yep. And also, as, as we know, in the interview process, people can be very, very different in the interview process to how they actually um, behave when they're oh, yeah. in their work environment. So you can have a beautiful coffee with someone and go, I like, I love this person. And they're just like me. So that must be good, right? Not. <laughs> um, and then you employ them and then sort of, you know, down the track, you realize you've made a, a hiring mistake. So yeah. what are the common mistakes that people make in terms of that interview process? So I, I think first and foremost is that people don't evaluate people based on evidence. They base they, they base their evaluation on on an interview based on biased personal motives or uh, assumptions, right. right? And that that's pretty much what people run off of. Um, so, you know, EOS companies have core values, right? We should yeah. be evaluating people for core values. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of companies make is they don't really drill into the core values of the company and yeah. see if and, and gather evidence to support whether or not somebody aligns with those values. Mm. And I've and said that, it with my clients is that, you know, you can come up with some core values, but it's very difficult to actually test that because if you say to somebody, you know, we've got um, a core value of be your word, for example, um, if you ask somebody just outright, you know, are you your word, it'd be really unlikely that anybody would ever say no to that. <laughs> Well, yeah. So, and if you ask it like that, you're right, yeah. right? Because everybody's going to say, "Oh, yes, that's me, of, of course." Because yeah. people lie in the interview, right? And <laughs> and by the way, we lie in the interview too, by saying yeah. our values are this. When you know the truth is that uh, we don't live those values a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there needs to be a language around the values that that uh, gives somebody a north star by which they can make make decisions, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, be your word. What does that mean exactly? We usually have a couple of lines under that as to what exactly that means and how somebody lives that within the organization. Yeah. So um, the way in which you back into that is you create uh, what are called um, behavioral interview questions, hmm. which in my mind are like, I don't think there's anything better in gathering details to understand whether or not somebody operates the same way that you operate. Right. And you can't use the, the phrase in it, but you have to kind of back into, you know, walk me through a time when da da da, da whatever that might be. Right. Mm -hmm. And you create these questions so that um, essentially you're getting an example of a real life situation in which they had a situation, how they handled it, how they felt about it, what they did, what the results were. That gives you a lot of data that you can pull from that gives you an accurate depiction of who that person is. Because it's really easy to just say, oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> but it's really hard to kind of make up things and lie, you know, in, in kind of mold your story toward, you know, what you think it might be. Yeah, okay. So that's one of the think the mistakes. What what else do you see happen in the? Because I mean, you've you've got two businesses at the moment. Don't you? You've got Stride Search and you've got Intertrue.ai, yep. which is your startup. Yep. So in the Stride Search, um, that's obviously um, recruitment. Um, what are the the other sort of things that you see happening that really are sort of pit pitfalls? So of uh, interviews not tied to values. Yep. Um, job descriptions terrible. Mm -hmm. People like copy job descriptions from large companies five years of this, four years of that, yeah. um, you know, start thinking of your job description more as a marketing document 
you know, if somebody gave you a job description as a marketing material that you, you know by which you you you're going to market your company, you'd fire them. Like job descriptions are just terrible. Yep. And then, um, and and I think the third thing is that um, not having a structured process by which you're bringing somebody through the interview process, right? So like, mm -hmm. just, hey, come in, we'll talk to you, we'll grab some coffee. Like those things are, are, are very casually done, but the impression that you're giving somebody is that we're a casual company. Yeah. We're not really a serious company because I don't take my interview process seriously, so you shouldn't either. <laughs> and, you know, if you're trying to attract A players, especially if you're a smaller company, you should, that's all you should be looking for are A players. Uh, they don't get impressed by, you know, just, you know, you buying them a latte or, yeah. you know, just having a conversation that's undirected and has no purpose behind it. So it's each, hmm. each uh, stage in your interview process needs to have a purpose tied to it and, and it needs to be communicated. Okay. So obviously, you know, this is your intertrue.ai is, is the new startup business and that is just recently launched. Is that right? Yeah, we launched two weeks ago. We're in um, our pilot program or a beta, I guess. Oh, We've got awesome. five customers using it. And yeah. of course, our first five trials on it crashed, but <laughs> we're, we're yep. loving it because we're figuring out, you know, all yeah. the bugs. But but uh, yeah, we got it. It seems to be working right now. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I mean, that's always the challenge, isn't it? You know, you, you build your MVP, it goes out there, it's a beta version. We've got the same thing with EOS 1 at the moment. It's, uh, you know, when it was launched in a beta version, it was really, really buggy. And yet, yeah. um, you know, until you start testing, you can't learn from that. So it feels terrible, but at the same time, huge learnings. Is is that uh, what's designed to kind of take the place of traction tools or... Or, yeah, or yeah. So it's, it's EOS's version of that software yeah. to run EOS purely in your business. So, Got it. Um, and okay. hey, look, you know, they've spent a lot of money. They've obviously had a lot of um, development time on it, but you don't actually get to find out what really works and what doesn't until you put it in the hands of your actual customers. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, you've got five customers QA using. Finest. So, what was that? Sorry? Modern day QA at its finest. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> So you've, you've just launched, you've got five kind of customers using the beta version. Um, what it, tell us a little bit about the software. Like what's it designed to do and who is it for? Yeah, absolutely. So look, at we, we, we designed it for companies that are anyone from like two people up to like 100. And mm -hmm. the idea is that we're, we're giving you a plug and play interview process that's built around your core values. Right. And, and essentially we've staged it out um, over the God, over the probably the past 10, 15 years, I, one of the things that I've done in my search practice is that um, I've come in to and approach searches from the perspective of, okay, look at, I'll take this search, but in order for us to do that, you have to run my interview process. Because I know that if you run it your way, you're probably not going to get as much great data out there to make the right decision. But um, I've kind of fine tuned and I developed this thing called a hiring operating system that um, essentially we just plug that into Intertrue and we allow you to kind of run that structure through through your inter your interview process. Okay. And the idea is to just um, to do two things. Number one, give everybody a roadmap by here's your questions. They're already pre-assigned. Here's sub questions so you can gather more detail. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we record, transcribe, and we have some technology that in the background, we'll analyze the content to let you know whether or not somebody's telling the truth, whether or not they're, you know, like, you know, is is this, um, is the data that you're collecting accurate? Yeah. And does it also pick up on things like tonalities and, and you know, the um, the trends of what the, what the person is actually sort of saying and how it comes across or... Not yet, but that's where it's headed. That's where it's headed. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's a big step away from your traditional kind of search um, background, which is very much service-based, and now you're going to a yeah. software as a service. Uh, what what made you decide to do that? I don't scale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I work searches and, you know, and I have a lot of fun with it, but you know, I can only benefit the companies that I work with and I can't benefit at a larger scale. So um, I I feel like, you know, being able to put this in the hands of smaller organizations can greatly improve their ability to be successful. Yeah. You know, because you, when 
you know, you know, when you have the right people in the right seat, um, then magic happens. Mm -hmm. When you don't, it's, you know, sometimes a plane crash getting ready to hit a train, you know, (laughs) a train wreck, right? So... (laughs) Sure. So your your core your core focus. Um, how would you describe that? Because that's obviously what's driving you to to reach more people and do more good work. What what is your core focus for? I mean, the, yeah, like, the core focus is just to like I don't know. I'm I'm partial to entrepreneurs because I am one, right? So yeah, I I I want to help shift the balance of power away from the transactional, you know, kind of model of what happens in hiring. You know, companies lose people all the time because some big company came in with an offer much higher. And what I've realized is that most people don't make a jump really for the money, but we kind of play that transactional game. And so when we get to the end, if we can't show that we have value, that we offer that person above and beyond what the other people do, mm-hmm. they're just going to go for the highest offer. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's just it's just me being able to... Um, to kind of help out my fellow entrepreneurs and get them to a point where like we win as opposed to, you know, the big boys. Absolutely. And I suppose it, you know, it's a win-win for not only the entrepreneurs who are employing, but also for the people who are coming on board because yeah. um, they're going to have, you know, happy, happy people. They're going to be happy in their role. They're going to love what they're doing, etc. cetera. So yeah, yeah. interesting. Okay. You've, you've also written a book and I have to say when, when I saw this, it's like healing career wounds. So your startup secret weapon to attract, hire and retain ridiculously successful people. But tell me a little bit, so the, the title, Healing Career Wounds, it's, um, it's interesting. Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I just had this vision of like walking through the airport and seeing the book and like, you know, going, oh, that's an interesting title. I would pick it up and read it. Right. Yeah. And see what yeah. it's about. Um, it's really the punchline, though. If you want to attract A players today, then you need to demonstrate how you can heal their career wounds. And most mm-hmm. people have them. You know, there's a lot of people that are in jobs right now that are working. They're, they're okay. They're doing well in their jobs, but they're not really in a place where, like, they're really thriving. Yep. And so if you're able to kind of tap them on the shoulder, have a conversation with them, learn what these career wounds are, And then be able to demonstrate or connect the dots for them that your opportunity actually helps them heal those career wounds. Mm -hmm. That's when that's that's when you've got a a situation where you, you know, it's super win win because that person's getting to a place where in which they're they're going to be able to um, grow their career and you're getting a a player that's going to just crush it in your company. Yeah. So that's kind of the idea. I mean, it's a guide for startups that you can just plug into your business. That's our hiring operating system, right? Yeah. Um, you can self-implement. <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> oh, look, I mean, with EOS, I'm, I'm all for people. Any, anybody who's just doing EOS, whether they self-implement or, or work with us, I'm all for it. Yeah, Anything to make the, the world a better place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, so when did you write the book? Um, I wrote it. I started writing it in 2019, and then I finished it during COVID because, you know, because I, I could. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And then we um, we released it last year. Oh, that's that's awesome. I look forward to getting hold of a copy, and we'll we'll put a link into the the bio in terms of where people can get hold of that. Now that, you that you've said great. a couple of times that you're an entrepreneur, and I can see that. And obviously, you know, you've you've been you've been running businesses your entire life. You've yeah. probably had some ups and downs in those businesses because we you know when we when we get when we think about business, particularly startups going you know into the startup space, they kind of imagine it's all just going to go that beautiful hockey stick curve, and everything's just going to go so smoothly, <laughs> and <laughs> you know you know yeah. it's just going to, and it doesn't work like that, does it? <laughs> no. No, no. I mean, uh, you know, I actually have a podcast too, and it was yes. kind of nice because I actually did see the hockey stick once we like started getting it going. Um, yeah, that was kind of cool to see. But then it kind of started doing this, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but then, yeah, like uh, you know, I, I probably had a lot more downs than ups for sure. Okay. Um, I just happen to be kind of stubborn. And I just keep going. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I. Um, I worked for somebody for a very long time. And when I moved to Hawaii, that was when I started up my recruiting firm. And, um, you know, we it, it was more of a lifestyle business than really a business mm-hmm. until I moved back to California and then, you know, kind of started these other projects that like are more passion projects. But I've, I've been able to turn them into a business, which has been really nice. Um, but they're you know, they're all tough. They, it just requires that you, you can constantly work on them and, and get them better. And 
you know, I, like I said, I fail way, way more often than I, than I succeed. So, so how, so that, I mean, that's interesting. I think probably you and I've got a similar kind of journey. I've had a few failures in my life as well, although I actually see them as learning experiences because I think yeah. I learn a, a lot more from the failures I do from the successes. But I mean, how do you keep yourself going? Because people say to me, gosh, you've been through so much. How do you keep yourself going? And, and, and for me, it's about, I know why I exist right on this planet. So I just keep tapping yeah. back into that. I've got to keep doing that. And if that means I have to keep falling down and getting back up again, I will keep doing it. But yeah, how do you keep yourself going? Um, Honestly, like I have times where like I just want, I just want to pull my pillow over my face and <laughs> not get back up. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think I have this kind of like thing. I don't know if it's like your greatest strength is always your greatest weakness or, de- you know, but mm-hmm. once I start something, I have to finish it. And the problem is that like a lot of things you start, you can't finish. Right. So yeah. um, I don't know. I just I I, I just kind of wake up. I don't drink coffee, but I do do ju- I, I do jujitsu like usually every morning, and that kind of wakes me up and gets me going. Because you know sometimes I have a good day, sometimes I have a bad day, um, but uh, you know it kind of kind of like okay, I already accomplished this, so now it puts me in a position where um, where I can go hammer out a bunch of stuff that I have to do. Mm. And switching from a service business to a software as a service business, which is very, very different, what have yeah. been the biggest challenges for you? Oh, gosh, getting out of the mindset of, you know, service-based business is all about, you know, business development and continually like, who's who's in my funnel? I got to wrap this thing up. I got to go find new business. Um, for me, it's always been a bit of a roller coaster ride, right? So yeah. you never have... A consistent amount of business. Sometimes you have too much and you have to turn it away, and then all of a sudden you finish things up faster than you thought you were going to, and then next thing you know, you, you have nothing. You know. <laughs> yep. Um. So that that's been um that's been a big challenge is just to change that mindset of me always being on the phone and and recruiting people and um and kind of running that business and shifting more toward uh, developing relationships and, you know, we're, we're developing a SaaS platform. So, um, we're really, uh, trying to make this sticky for, for, um, for customers. So like I'm, I'm doing a lot of customer, you know, gathering information and stuff like that. I've been around startups. So I I kind of understand how they operate and how successful companies operate, thankfully. Yeah. Yeah, Um, so that that's been, you know, I've, I've seen so many do a lot of things that I, I put in my memory banks and I'm like, okay, I will not do that. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Learn from their mistakes, which is, which is great. So you say we, is this a project you're doing with another co-founder or? Um, yeah, is it you I have a take? co-founder. Yeah. yeah, I have a co-founder. His name is Awesome. <laughs> like, so you can't even have a better name for a co-founder. <laughs> I love it. Seriously, that's his name. Yeah, his name's Awesome. Yeah. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. and so that that would be quite interesting for you, wouldn't it? Being going from running your own business on your own to having a co-founder. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, we're we're going actually full venture on this. Like, so I'm I'm yeah. raising capital. I'm kind of I'm going that whole route. Right. Um, I, you know, again, I've been around it for most of my career, so I, I'm. Mm. It, it's not completely foreign to me. It's just. Um, and, and it's been, it's actually been really nice to not be, have everything on my shoulders to be able to kind of balance things off my, off my co-founder's shoulders. Mm-hmm. Um, but it took me a long time, you know, since I do recruiting, I, I like I vetted and you know, like we had lots of conversations before we started working together Yeah, and it was about kind of understanding what he wanted and understanding what was important to him and, and, and and seeing if we were in alignment, because if we were in alignment, there was no reason to kind of continue me selling the job. So I, I talked to a, a lot of people. I talked to a lot of people that I know in the industry and mm-hmm. I had a few the bit, but didn't really like it. And, you know, awesome. And I just kind of like we resonated with each other. So that 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 tended to work. Yeah. But it's been I'm, it's been great yeah. so far. 
Okay. I must admit, I mean, I, I work with more established businesses these days. Obviously, with the EOS, it's really for that sort of more established business. But I spent yeah. seven years working with the Ice House over here, um, which is one of the top sort of incubators in the world and, and did a lot of work with startups and market validation and taking things to market, raising funds and things. And, you know, everybody always wanted a co-founder. And my, my thing was, that absolutely, it's great to do it with somebody, but do make sure you find the right person. Because to me, it's yeah. a little bit like getting married, right? If you don't have yeah. the right sort of shared values, if you don't have the same vision, Vision in mind if you're not on the same page with all of that it's going to be a, a, a pretty miserable relationship <laughs> yeah yeah it is and by the way i'm usually the one brought in to fix those situations ah. quite often you know are you yeah usually when yeah usually when the company's like get around getting their series a and and the team is like hey look you know we've got so-and-so here completely not working we need to replace that person and then that's mm -hmm. that's always been the like the role that i've come in and, and helped fill yeah. So I'm very familiar with that. I've seen way too many, you know, nightmare stories. Yeah, no, same here. Okay, cool. So like, you've also got a podcast, as you said. So, and I was just reading about that, and it's sort of. Um, <laughs> so we're not running a school for gifted mutants, with Professor X. I host the Higher Power Radio Show and podcast. <laughs> Please tell me more about that, because that is again has just completely piqued my interest. <laughs> oh my god, that was one of the. So yeah, one of my employees used to like call me Professor X. Um, yeah. for some reason, probably because of the bald head, you know, <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was, yeah, it was just kind of a joke that made it into the bio and people like it. So we left it. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So what, tell me about the podcast. What is it you do on the podcast? Yeah. So the podcast is called higher power radio. It's not a religious show, by the way. It's, mm. it's about hiring higher as H I R E. -E, -E. Yeah. 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 <laughs> higher power radio. And the premise behind the show is that we bring on entrepreneurs and, VCs and, and professionals who are really like who have figured out like how to hire, you know, in a way that works for them. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of we, we identify a specific problem and then we provide the solutions that hopefully other entrepreneurs can take and plug into their businesses. Yep. So that's okay. that's the aim of the show. Do we get it every episode? We're, we're, we're getting pretty close, but oh, sometimes we don't. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so we've got guys. There's such a lot of information here that we just sort of talked about. I, I would yeah. really love to kind of condense that all down into sort of three things that the listeners can take away from this and go, "Hey, I can do this in my business right now to start making a difference." What would those three things be? Do you think for you, Rick? <clears throat> well, um, I think uh, first and foremost, um, values are super important. Like the companies that I know that are the most successful, and and. By the way, like people don't ever want to leave, you know, it's really easy to retain people was when people align with the values of the company. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, look at your values, ask yourself if they're real and if they're real, then make sure you've got some context to it, some measurable, um, you know, kind of wording to it that you can, that people can uh, align to, right? Mm -hmm. And then take that data and build your interview questions around that because that's what's going to determine whether or not somebody's successful. I don't know if you know this, but Amazon has been doing this since the early days where 70% of the hiring decision is based on whether or not somebody aligns with the values of the company. Mm. They know that they can teach skills, yeah. but if somebody doesn't align with their core values, they're not going to work out. Mm. So arguably the, the best success story, right? Um, and I, I don't know why more people don't copy that. Um, but you know, they, they've, they, they've certainly crushed it year over year for a very, very long time. Yeah. I do. Well, I do wonder if it's that. I mean, I, I've spent some time for my sins in kind of corporate world, and often the the values piece was really a tick in the box. You know, yep, tick. We've got some values. They're on that wall. Yeah, we off we go. And they weren't real, and they weren't authentic, and and yeah. they try to shove yeah. them into an acronym of the name of the company or whatever they might do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think that if you're going, if you've had that introduction to it and then you're going into your own business you don't see the true value of getting these things right whereas yeah. if you've worked in a company where you know they really genuinely live breathe hire fire by their core values you can see how important they genuinely are yeah exactly and you know you're right like i most company i've walked into so many companies where you know they have their values and they're all oh my god i don't even know what do these mean i don't see any teamwork that's going on here as i walk yeah. around i see people hiding you know, and, and, um, you know, you, you, you just have to live those. 
Um, yeah. I think even if you have an environment that's like you would, some people consider a harsh environment, like you have a bunch of backstabbing people who, you know, you eat what you kill and, you know, lock your desk at all costs. I mean, I would love to see those values in some company. <laughs> you know? It's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. true. But not only that, people, there are people that are like, yes, I want this. Yep. You know, yeah. I think when and companies I, get into trouble is because they say that there's something that they're not and then it becomes a, you know, harsh work environment. Yeah. And I think it's also true. It's like, um, you're right, there are people, different people have different values. And so they may not fit in with your organization, but they yeah. could be really great for another organization. I think sometimes people struggle to let people go. Um, yeah. But it's actually the best thing for both parties, because they'll go and find somewhere where they actually do fit in with the values and are in a better space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you, you don't want to waste time on somebody that's not even going to accept your offer, right? Yeah. Like just, it doesn't, it's never made sense to me you know, the, the recruiting model where, you know, you're going to get a hundred resumes, interview 20 people, make three to five offers, and hopefully somebody accepts, yep. you know, because it's, uh, you're not getting your top, you're usually not getting your top 10 or your bottom 10%, right? Like you're screening out them right off the top. Right. And then, and then, so what are you getting? You're getting the middle 80% and hopefully, you know, somebody resonates with you and accepts the offer. And then if they work out, it's purely based on luck. Mm. If they don't, I mean, actually I, I read a statistic not too long ago where you have like a 51% chance of making a wrong hire just with a normal interview process. So you're yeah, better off actually huge. just walking into the room, flipping a coin. You'll do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Heads you're hired, yeah. tails you're not. Yep. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so we've got make sure that you've got your values, make sure they're real, Build, uh, use that data to build your interview questions around it. And then finally? Um, and then finally, um, co train and coach your people, like get your people um, understanding the value, like, well, understanding the language of your values mm -hmm. and, and um, using it within the organization by, by how the people in your company make decisions. Mm -hmm. empowering them to make decisions based on, hey, are we, you know, I forgot the value that you said earlier, but, you know, are we being real? Or, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and uh, usually when it's um, a ba like a, ba you can, when you can use it as a basis to, by which you make decisions, then people make better decisions and, you know, you don't have as many problems um, that, that happen. And then also, you know, as, as, people go into an interview, they should understand that the purpose of this interview is to gather this data. You know, they should be trained on how to run an interview, talk to people, um, not what not to say, but really how to listen, how to ask questions and listen and gather data. Love it. Brilliant. Okay, yeah. so we've got some really great tips there. We've also got some things that people can do that will actually help them. So you've got your book there that um, people should definitely have a look at, um, The Healing Career Wounds, which we'll put the link in the, in the thing. What about your new software? I mean, is that sort of – I know it's in beta stage, but is it ready for people to start jumping on board? Or Yeah, actually, we're building our, our customer list right now. So it's um, intertrue.ai. It's I-N-T-E-R-T-R-U dot A-I. Mm -hmm. um, we're, yeah, we're, we, we're building a list. I think I've got about 18 companies right now. So we just wanted a beta with five. Yep. And then, um, but we're going to be adding more, more companies as we go along. So. Excellent. And yeah. then obviously we've got the podcast as well. So the higher power radio is an H I R E power radio. Yep. Um, and so, but if people want to get in contact with professor X himself, um, <laughs> how can they, how can they do that? <laughs> I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, yep. You can also probably drop me an email at rick at stridesearch.com. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty open. I, like, I get a lot of email, though, so it might take me a few days to get back to you. Sure. But, um, yeah, I'm always, I'm always happy to, uh, you know, to help when I can. No, that's beautiful. Hey, look, yeah. thank you so much for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Some really good tips and pointers in there, which, of course, all fit in perfectly with our whole EOS, right? People, right? Seat stuff. So that's always good. Um, exactly. Good luck with the, the new, you know, the new software. I hope it goes um, swimmingly for you. Uh, I look thank forward to, to reading your book and, and hopefully sharing some stuff from that as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Deborah. It was really nice to meet you. My absolute pleasure. Thank you.